Hi, Chris, and thanks so much for joining me on the Rescue Tales podcast today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think when we talk about dogs diets, there's a lot of kind of accepted truths that we don't really question as dog owners. So I'm really looking forward to picking your brain about some of the underlying science and the do's and don'ts and and busting some of the myths as well. But before we jump into that, tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, what do you do for a living? And of course, we'd love to know who your dogs are. Okay. So my name is Kristen Neal. I am a certified veterinary technician in Massachusetts in the USA. And so to do that, I had to get a college degree and take a national certification. My veterinary technician training and background is in general practice, in surgery and anesthesia, in rescue work, and in nutrition. And to maintain that certification, I have to do 12 hours of education minimum every single year to maintain that. And so at this point in time, I divide that education mostly between nutrition and behavior. And I still keep my hands in the anesthesia world a little bit, just so I don't lose that skill. I am also a certified force-free dog trainer. I have my certification through the Council for Pet Dog Trainers here in the USA. And I have to maintain that certification with another 36 hours every three years. So what really marries all of my loves together is a passion for improving quality of life for pets and their people. I I have seen so many, I know we were chatting before we started recording about why you got started with this. And I have seen so many people just feel at a loss with their dogs, you know, especially working in the rescue field for three and a half years and being in depth in that. And seeing dogs being surrendered and the reasons they were being surrendered. And sometimes it was just sheer finances, homelessness, but a lot of times it was behavior issues with the dogs that people had no idea what to do with, you know? So that's what got me involved in all of this and, and why I do what I do. And actually professionally right now, a big part of my job is working with a pet insurance company with Trupanion and I'm the liaison between the hospitals and the company itself, but that's, that's my moneymaker and benefited job (laughs) so that I can keep dog training and doing nutritional consults on the side. Yeah. And my dogs, I have two dogs currently. They are both rescue dogs. Maggie was adopted through Thomas J. O'Connor Animal Control Center, which is one of the local rescues. They do animal control for three of our local cities. And they take in and any animals that are found or taken from their families are hopefully brought back to health and adopted out into the community. And so Maggie came when I was working in surgery with a local referral hospital, and she was brought to us because they couldn't pass the proper size endotracheal tube when they went to spay her at the rescue And so they brought her to us thinking that she had a tumor in her throat and it turned out to be scar tissue. Somebody had surgically debarked her. So yeah, cut her vocal cords. I didn't even know that was a a thing that people do. (gasps) Things like this have been illegal in Europe for many, many years and are still, I, I think are still legal in many parts of the United States. So surgically, you can cut a dog's vocal cords so that they are unable to make noise so that they're not a quote nuisance with their barking, rather than dealing with the underlying reasons that they're barking in the first place. So it turns out she had scar tissue in her throat. We were able to surgically remove most of that scar tissue so that she would go on. She still has side effects from that surgery, from the original debarking. And I've had her for almost eight years now. And then my second dog, Ella, is almost 20 months old now, another rescue. They're both bully breeds. I've done DNA on both of them now because I just couldn't stand not knowing. And Maggie is an American bully, which is a bully type breed bred specifically for her temperament. And Ella is a pit bull terrier, an American Staffordshire terrier. And she came to me originally as a foster dog. I was looking for a dog for a friend of mine. And I put out the word on my social media rescue contacts and immediately got an answer from the director of Thomas J. O'Connor saying, can you please take this dog to foster her? She is a wild child and she will lose her mind in the kennel. Okay. And so I took her home and 
She is an absolute angel. She has some issues that have come up as she's entered adolescence, but she is such a sweetheart. She was not a good fit for my friend's family and she was a perfect fit for mine. So I adopted her. That's amazing. It's always, oh, there's so, so many things I want to say just based off of that introduction, but it's incredible how animal dogs can behave so differently in a shelter. And it's about the environment that they're in and, and you cannot judge a dog based on yeah. how it, how it behaves in a shelter. I mean, I think yeah. if, you know, imagine if we were thrown into that environment, we wouldn't be the same people we are when we we're in our comfortable homes, familiar environment, familiar people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But and, you, you know, dogs with no, no training, you know, I, I think about dogs and I tell my training clients this a lot. Imagine that you're sucked up onto the alien spaceship. So you are now in a completely different culture mm. with a completely different species. You have no idea what the language is. You don't know what's expected. How would you feel? How would you behave? What would you do? Yeah. You know, and that's your dog. It's even, even though we evolutionarily, we, have, we have come to work together and we're symbiotic. They're still a completely different species and they are not born knowing our culture, our language and our expectations and rules. And then you factor into that, that the expectation is different from home to home, you know, and you take that dog and you put them in a kennel or in a new home. Yeah. It, yeah. We have incredibly high expectations of our dogs. And I think the mistake I see time and time again is we expect so much from them, yet we do not give them enough. And we were talking about, you know, before we started recording about like kind of the hi the, the hierarchy yeah. of needs and it's not just food and shelter and then expect them to follow commands. It's, they are, you know, they, they have emotions and psychologies yeah. and we need to understand how and why those are driving the behaviors. But I want to go back to a point, you know, that you, you touched on as you were telling us about, Maggie and just how many dogs end up in a shelter because of what's deemed as you know behavioral problems I was reading it somewhere between seven and twenty percent adult adopted dogs end up being returned and those are the official stats so it doesn't include yeah. you know people who've chucked the dog out dogs passed away dogs been given away it's a much right. bigger problem than to a different home exactly. because it wasn't a good fit they exactly. didn't know how to manage exactly. the behavior or train or yeah yeah and and but as you mentioned, you know, one of the main reasons is the dog's behavior. And one of the things I find fascinating is how little we talk about the impact of food on a dog's behavior, despite the fact that there's so much science now around the impact of food on humans behavior, especially children, yeah. hyperactivity and all this. And it's all right. Okay. So physiologically, there must be commonalities there, but I'd love to, you know, understand from your perspective, how does a dog's diet affect its behavior and is there any kind of link between diet and you know aggressive behaviors what's actually happening there yeah absolutely there is a link so there are really several ways that diet affects behavior um one of the ways is that if there is a high carbohydrate content in the diet dogs biologically there are carnivores i know a lot of people think of dogs as omnivores but they really aren't they have biologically evolved to eat a little bit of plant material to eat certain grains. Wild canids, when we watch wild canids out in their own environment, they will nibble on some berries, they'll nibble on some grasses. But if you look, those things pass through completely undigested because dogs don't have the teeth to properly grind plant material. And so the only way they can extract nutrients from carbohydrates is if they're already partially digested. So for example, the stomach and intestinal contents of the prey that they eat, that's basically partially digested already, pre-digested. So if it's already ground up, they're able to extract nutrients from it, but they are not biologically suited to extract nutrients from carbohydrates and they have zero nutritional requirements for carbohydrates as a macronutrient. So, so when we, sorry, go sorry Krista, I just want, I, yeah, just to make sure that I understand what you're saying. So are you saying if I give my dog, I don't know, lettuce, for example, <laughs> yes. it won't be able to 
derive any nutritional value from that as as a correct. food source. Okay. Correct. Okay. And that's not to say you shouldn't give your dog vegetables, but they should be prepared in a way that your dog can extract nutrients from them. Okay. So, so when you take a dog and you give them a high carbohydrate diet, so let's take, for example, your standard kibble, dry food, right? Any dry food requires carbohydrates to make it a kibble. And I'm not talking about like freeze dried or air dried, but your, your typical crunchy kibble that is processed with extrusion, which is the, the processing method that they use to make little baked crunchy bits that we, you know, buy a large bag, we get the biggest bag we can usually because it's cheaper per pound, right? To get that or per kilogram to buy that large bag of food. And it's easy to scoop it and measure it. And it's easy to store it. And it's easy to travel with it if you travel with your dog. And the vet tells you that's a complete and balanced diet. And so you buy that diet and you scoop it and you put it in the bowl and the dog eats it. Except all of those forms from the highest grade to the lowest grade run usually a minimum of 40% carbohydrate. So you're now taking 40% of the calories your dog eats and giving it to them in a form that they have no biologic need for. So what happens with a high carbohydrate diet, and actually the same thing happens to humans if we eat too many processed carbohydrates, is it increases inflammation through the entire body. That upsets the gut microbiome, which is part of your immune system and affects every single system in your body. So our bodily systems and our dog's bodily systems, they don't operate in a vacuum. So when you're feeding a, a species inappropriate diet, a high carbohydrate diet, you're increasing inflammation. Increased inflammation leads to things like allergies, GI disturbances, arthritis, cancer, diabetes, increased blood sugar, all, all kinds of Addison's and Cushing's disease imbalance in the adrenal glands, all of those are impacted or caused by chronic inflammation. Some of those are genetically predisposed and chronic inflammation then triggers that gene expression. So it's not like you're going to take a dog that has no cancer genes and give them cancer by feeding an improper diet. But if you have a dog that has cancer genes, you can turn on those genes and express them through an improper diet. So that's really, that's the biggest way that diet, as far as behavioral health goes, just like with people, additives, chemical additives, so chemical preservatives, there is huge links with chemical preservatives and with artificial flavors and colors. And a lot of the research with dogs right now is extrapolated from human research. But here in the U.S., there is an organization, if anybody's interested in following this, this is one of my biggest, I love following this organization. There's an organization called CANWI, C-A-N-W-I. That's the Companion Animal Nutrition and Wellness Institute. They are a nonprofit and they are set up specifically to study nutrition for dogs and the effects of different types of foods on dogs in all kinds of ways, behavior, health, aging, all of that. One of the biggest things that they are funding research that they are funding these days has to do with um, something called advanced glycation end products, which all foods have some AGEs in them, but the higher the AGE level in your food, the faster your cells age, all of the cells in your body and the more inflammation is caused. And so all of that has an effect on our dogs. Guess what kind of food has the highest AGE levels? Kibble. Okay. So if you take, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you take three ounces of chicken, yep. just raw chicken breast, it has 800 AGEs. That same three ounces of chicken fried has 8,000 AGEs. So how we process our food mm. is as important as the quality of the initial ingredients. So for decades, vets have been looking at macronutrients and micronutrient balances and saying, okay, if this food meets this nutrient profile, then it's good. And I'm not saying discount that because it absolutely has to meet a minimum nutrient profile to sustain life and a certain level of health. But 
for 15 years in the veterinary field, I've been watching animals not thrive on that diet, like a large percentage of animals not thriving on the minimum requirements in a processed food. And so now what can we is really looking at and what I've started looking at in the last probably seven or eight years now is what are we doing to those ingredients and how are we presenting that nutrient profile? What form does it come in? Right. I don't know if you've seen the movie supersize me. Yeah. It, yeah. So that was a movie, a, a documentary for anyone who's not familiar with it, where the documentary filmmaker ate three meals a day at McDonald's mm. and you know, you can, you can get a certain nutrient profile eating at a fast food restaurant, but how is that food processed and what does it do to your body? And he followed this with blood work. And that, that movie, like I always knew that fast food was not super healthy, but I didn't correlate it to the fact that kibble is basically fast food for our dogs. So, oh gosh, there's so much to unpick here. I, and so I, I just want to make sure that listeners can go with some really practical takeaways from this. So th there's, cause my, I I'm, you know, I'm a marketer by trade. So I understand how companies use words on their packaging mm -hmm. to make something seem, you know, healthier or better than it actually it is. is. And, you know, you look at like products for, for people, you might have some sort of, a, you know, nut bar that's actually yes. full of sugar, yeah. but they're allowed right. to call it, you know, use a certain word, like, you know, in nature, Right. And it yeah. always kind of give, gives you associations that yes. oh, it must be a healthier version of whatever. Exactly. But actually, when you and look at the contents, it's it's it's, you know, just as bad as eating right. a bar of chocolate, really. Right. Um, and with dog food, they'll do pictures of animals grazing on a farm. But that food actually came from, you know, animals that died in transit on the way to the slaughterhouse. Yeah. From a rendering plant, not, you know, those those cattle never saw a blade of grass in their lives. They were feedlot cattle raised specifically to be feed grade or you know, ones that didn't make the cut for human meat because the quality wasn't good enough. And that's what gets put in a lot of, not all dog food, but a lot of dog food. Yeah. Is there any, so are there, is there anything specifically in terms of when we're looking at, you know, because at the end of the day, I, I mean, I, I feed my dog, the, what do you call it? The um, freeze dried. Yeah. Kibble. So, yeah. yeah. And freeze dried or air dried kibble as opposed to extruded or baked. So it's yes. still, it's still shelf stable. It's still easy to measure. It's still easy to store. But is that, is that a good option or is it just the best of the worst? I guess my question is <laughs> because there is the question of, you know, I work full time and I would, mm -hmm. If I, if, if I was told actually the diet you're feeding your dog is not optimal, I would make that. I would just figure out the yeah. time to cook and batch every week and, and just make it work. But if there is a convenient option, just like there were convenient options for us yeah. as humans that are still perfectly Absolutely. healthy for us. So I guess mm -hmm. how, how do you assess without getting into specific brands, but how do you assess yeah. whether a, you know, a type of kibble, whether it's air or freeze dried is or wet food, whatever, how do you assess if it's good for your dog or not? Like what are the big no-nos to avoid on the labels and what should we actually be looking for when we look at the labels as well? So what I look at are, I look at the nutritional panel. So what is, what is the nutrient profile essentially? I look at the ingredients and I look at the processing method. So when you combine all of those things, so your nutrient label, dogs need a minimum of adult dogs. I'm talking adult healthy yep. dogs. So when I talk about these, these profiles, that's understand that that's the platform I'm starting from. Growing puppies, different dogs with health issues might have different requirements depending on the dog, but a minimum nutrient requirement for protein is 16%. Okay. That is a bare minimum, a dog's ancestral diet on a dry matter basis. And that's what, again, when we talk about nutrient profiles, sorry if I'm getting too technical here, but dry matter basis versus as fed basis, you can look at a tray or a can of wet food, and it might only say it has 8% protein or 10% protein. That's on an as fed basis. If you remove all the water from that, what's left, how much protein is in what's left percentage wise look at a bag of 
kibble, it's usually less than 10% protein. I mean, mm-hmm. 10, sorry, less than 10% water. And it might have 16, 18, 22, 36% protein. So I am looking for, because a dog's ancestral diet on a dry matter basis is going to have about 49% protein. I am looking for the highest protein content I can find in a processed food. Okay. Whether that processing is freezing, whether that process is freeze-dried, air-dried, whether that process is canning or extruding, I'm looking for the highest protein content I can find because that's going to most closely match a dog's ancestral diet. Okay. Okay. I am looking at the ingredients list and what order ingredients appear in. So I avoid corn, wheat, soy, artificial flavors, artificial colors, and artificial preservatives. Okay. So I avoid things like ethoxyquin as a preservative, which is in a lot of packaged baked extruded kibbles that are on a lower price point range mm-hmm. and in some that are on a higher price point range. So I avoid things like that. Corn, wheat, and soy are some of the most genetically modified foods in our food system in the world, mm. which means that they are naturally higher in cancer causing known carcinogens yeah. in Roundup and other herbicides, pesticides that are sprayed on our foods. So the, those genetically modified crops are genetically modified specifically to withstand those chemicals. So you don't kill the plant that you're trying to grow, but that means that those crops are laden with those chemicals and our dogs are eating them every single meal, every single day of their lives. So I try to avoid those. If it's possible to get human grade and organic, that's my preference. It, whatever form you feed your food in, human grade organic is always going to rank higher on my list. Nutritionally balanced is number one on my list. So I would rather see somebody feed a nutritionally balanced feed grade ultra processed kibble than feed an unbalanced home cooked meal because you can do a tremendous amount of damage by just feeding your dog chicken and rice. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, because you're missing some you you know, you've got almost no calcium in that diet. And then you've got a dog with an extreme calcium deficiency because they've got no calcium. You don't have enough iodine in that or enough sodium in that diet if you just cook chicken breast and rice for your dog and say, "Well, you know, he loves it. This is great. That's a good bland diet for a brief amount of time, but it's not a good long-term diet." right? It's also probably way too high in carbohydrates with the rice in it. I don't feed any grains to my dogs. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that some dogs can't process grains, but I don't feed any grains to my dogs because they have no nutritional requirement for them. So it's just filler, Mm -hmm. really just making bigger stool and filling them up with fiber. So if you have a dog that's grossly overweight, but acts like he's starving when you reduce their diet, a little bit of a whole grain to bulk up the diet and add a little bit of fiber and help satiate your dog Mm. might not be a bad idea, but they have no nutritional requirement for it. And I wouldn't do it with a dog that has GI issues. I wouldn't do it with a dog that has arthritis or cancer because you're just feeding the cancer because that just turns to sugar in the bloodstream. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm a very circular conversation person. <laughs> no, this is, no, this is uh, because I've just seen here listening to you. And, and every time you say something, I just have more and more questions and I'm conscious of time. I want to, I want to actually loop back. Cause I think the point is you gave in terms of, you know, ensuring that they have a nutritionally balanced meal, understanding the percentage of, of, of protein. And you said a minimum of 16% and you're actually better off giving them a, a, a nutritionally balanced diet through a good quality kibble that's you know right. maybe air dried or freeze dried yeah. I need to do more research into what those processes actually mean because apart from yeah. words on a packaging I don't really feel I understand it in depth enough but um, I can tell you a little bit about that so when you're looking at processing your typical baked or extruded kibble and canned foods are a high heat high pressure processed okay so those are what we would call an ultra processed food 
Okay. So high heat, high pressure is actually going to really increase those AGEs that I mentioned earlier. So as far as processing goes, those are in my mind, the least desirable. Those forms of food have to have a lot added back into them because the nutritional quality has been destroyed. There are no live enzymes in those at all. So there's nothing to help the dog process the food and extract the nutrients. You basically killed everything off and then added back in synthetic vitamins and minerals for the most part. Okay. I see. So you can have this fabulous ingredient list but then they have to add back in all these extra vitamins and minerals. So you can start with, you know, whole fresh chicken and vegetables and blueberries. And you'll see this, this is where the marketing comes in. You'll see, Mm. you know, contains blueberries for antioxidants. Well, how many antioxidants can you get out of a blueberry? If you smash it up, mix it with a whole bunch of different things, process it at about 380 degrees at high pressure, and spit it out the other end as a brown nugget. It, you know, does your blueberry have any nutritional value anymore at that point? I'm going to argue the answer is no. There's no antioxidant value in that. The antioxidant value comes in eating fresh food. When you air dry or freeze dry, you are not destroying the live enzymes. Okay. And so you still have live enzymes in those food, but in a more shelf stable packaging. So air dried or freeze dried kibble is far preferable as far as a processing method goes. Okay. That, and that's, that's super helpful. I want to, I want to circle back to the first kind of topic we talked about, which is, you know, you've, you've gone now into quite a bit of detail around some of the the health implications of a poorly balanced diet or a highly processed diet for our dogs. What's the link? Is there a link? And if so, what is that link between certain types of diets and aggressive behavior in in particular? So if your dog has chronic inflammation, they're likely to have chronic low level pain. Are there any chronic pain sufferers among the listeners here? I can raise my hand. You can't see me. I know Nihal, you can see me on camera. Raising my hand, chronic pain, migraines, nerve pain. Chronic pain makes me downright nasty at Mm. times, right? I have to work really hard to sometimes if, if my pain gets to a certain level, if I'm not careful with my medications and my schedule and with what I do in my day-to-day life, I get to a point where, you know, you you may have all heard the spoons reference where I've run out of spoons. Mm -hmm. When I get to that point, I can be mean if I have to keep going. Mm -hmm. That's your dog with chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. Imagine having chronic low-level GI distress. Imagine having chronic acid reflux. And, you know, and many of your listeners probably live with these things, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine having chronic joint pain. And how does that affect your attitude? And your dog doesn't have the processing capability. This is where dogs and humans differ. Yes, they have feelings, they're sentient beings, but they have the cognitive processing ability of the average two-year-old human. You can't tell a two-year-old to take a deep breath and maybe go do some yoga and meditate and you know it's okay it's going to be over soon these are the, these are the things that i do to work through my own pain and get through the day without you know physically or figuratively biting someone's head off yeah right when i don't feel well mm. i get through my day by talking myself through it. And your dog can't do that. So your dog has no option, but to curl up in a corner, try to avoid, or when pressed snap lunge, right? Lash out to protect themselves because in dog language, oftentimes the best defense is a good offense, Mm -hmm. right? If I want to take care of myself, I need to make space and I make space with my words, because people often miss the subtle signs, right? Mm -hmm. People miss the slight stiffening, the mouth getting shorter and closing a little bit, the ears either going slightly back or slightly further forward, the eyes getting sort of round and starey instead of soft, 
people miss those subtle signs, the tail getting still mm. or being a high tight, you know, mm. aroused wag. People miss that stuff until you get to a growl, a snarl, a snap, a bite, a lunge. We're, unless you're trained to observe your dog's body language, like a lot of people aren't. And so they miss the subtle signals until the dog has to get stronger. So that chronic low-lying inflammation can cause chronic pain. Chronic pain can lead to aggression, 100% for sure. The other thing is, is this chronic hyperarousal I'm seeing in a lot of dogs, which isn't true aggression. It is, it's like kids with um, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder that can't keep their body still and can't slow their brains down. Yeah. And so they often end up accidentally hurting someone just because of their high level of activity and arousal. And I'm seeing this more and more and more in dogs. And I believe that there is, there have been genetic changes in our dogs over the last 10 or 15 generations based on the fact that a huge segment of the dog population is eating ultra processed, high carbohydrate food. Mm. There isn't a definitive scientific link yet. So I'm just going to, you know, caveat that with, that's my belief that that's a contributing factor. I do believe that, that the high carbohydrate, high chemical load, and not all chemicals are bad either. Like you said, I don't take a hard line stance, good, bad, but the, the high carcinogenic chemical load, the high processing does affect a dog's behavior. And there are a certain number of dogs who actually can become really overweight and lethargic due to all of the fillers that are in our food. There's a large food company that's very popular with veterinarians in the USA, and I'm not going to name names, but I was at a veterinary conference doing some continuing education and a lot of companies have their tables set up, marketing tables. And this representative from this company had said to me, yeah, we just started making a grain-free food because it's this big fat and everybody wants grain-free food now. So we felt like we had to do that to stay viable in the market. But, you know, really corn is a good source of protein if you process it appropriately. And I just looked at him like, did you just really say that corn is protein? And Sure, just about any food has some protein molecules in it, but if you have to process a food that heavily to extract a gram of protein out of how many kilograms of food, is that really a viable nutrient source for your dog? And this is a major label company with veterinarians on staff that has done the, you know, the AFCO feeding trials. I don't know if you've all heard of that in Europe. Here in the United States, we have an organization called the American Association of Feed Control Officials. Mm -hmm. And it's an organization made up of people from pet food companies that do feeding trials. So they take dogs in a laboratory and they feed them the food and only that food for six months. And if they're alive with no grave illness at the end of six months, they say it passed a feeding trial and it's good to go. And I think keeping dogs alive or cats alive for six months is a pretty low bar to me for food. And that's what many veterinarians hold up as the gold standard. And I'm not saying the veterinarians are wrong. Please don't, don't get me wrong. I am not a veterinarian. I do not have that four years of study and the degree, but I do know from having many friends that are veterinarians, that veterinarians nutrition study in that four years is pretty limited in the grand scheme of things because they have so many other things they need to learn. And yeah, it, it is heavily biased because of nutrient panels and making sure that dogs get a balanced macro and micronutrient profile. It is, it's heavily biased toward ultra processed foods made by large companies with veterinarians on staff, because for decades, all we looked at was that nutrient profile. And we didn't look at what the processing did to the, to the food and what long-term effects the processing has. And that's where that organization, Can We, is coming in, in that they are, they are funding that research. They are funding PhD level 
research and peer reviewed papers mm -hmm. on what the effects of the processing are. You know, it's, it's really interesting your comment about, you know, vets and the, you know, the, how, how much of the study is is focused on nutrition. And I think back to, you know, human doctors, it's the same problem, right? A lot of the time there are, there are problems and, you know, sometimes they're mental health problems, you know, sometimes they're physiological problems and the, the root cause can be traced back to diet, but a lot of the time that's not caught early on by your family doctor, your GP, if you're in the UK and it's not the first port of call. I've never been asked what my diet's like, but now I think about it and it's incredible how much research there is today. And I'm, I'm going to look at, can we, and I'll link to it in the, in the show notes, because I think it's fascinating. We think about there's sufficient evidence now in human research to demonstrate the gut brain link, yeah. right? And the impact of what we eat on our mental health. One could safely presume, I would imagine, that there are some similarities there in, in the world of, of, of dogs as well. But just going back to, you know, to some of the practical takeaways for listeners, if we were to think about, you know, if I think about my diet, right? If I was to think, you know, on a scale of one to 10, one being absolute rubbish, just processed food, you know, crisps, fast food, you know, just stuff that I basically didn't understand what was in, even on the label. You know, my, my rule book when I eat is like, if it doesn't have a mother or it doesn't come from the ground, I, I, I'm not going to eat it. If I can't understand the, the the ingredients on the label, then I shouldn't be putting that in my body. So like say one is just complete utter crap. And then 10, excuse my use of very technical terms here. And 10 would be, you know, organic, you know, f fresh fruit, vegetables, grass fed, beef chicken whatever but sourced in you know in, in in a way that's as kind as possible to 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 the animals and so forth and it's you know well balanced nutritionally on that and, and maybe others would argue that 10 is something else in the world of humans right but on that scale in the world of dogs what's like the worst you can be giving them and what's the absolute best i just want to kind of do that on a scale yeah, because how for people to understand well maybe yeah. i don't have the time to be you know to be cooking food at home for my animals right. and i right. need the convenience like how bad is you know how how good can i get and steer away from the stuff that's okay. really really bad for my pet absolutely so 10 i'm going to start with my gold standard 10 in my mind would be human grade organically raised, pasture fed or free range, depending on the animal, meat-based balanced diet with no grains. That would be my gold standard. Whether you can source that, ethically source that fresh and grind it and mix it and prepare it yourself or feed it in whole chunks and bones, however you wanna feed it, or whether you buy that commercially prepared and prepackaged in tubes or patties or meatballs, whatever, that would be my gold standard. And would that be, so when you say the meat and you say no grains, what other foods would, would be mixed with that? So actually I can use the food that I feed my own dogs as an example, because oh. it's a very small company, regional, only in the Northeast. They don't sell through stores. It's only available direct supply through small co-ops that are formed locally. Mm. They use all pasture raised meats. They use the pretty much the whole animal. So you've got a foundation of about 80% muscle tissue, 10% organ tissue, and 10% bone. And that's the foundation of the food. They add to that just because almost nowhere in the world is the soil really nutritionally complete. So what the animals are eating, mm. not always guaranteed hundred percent. So with some veterinary input, they have added to that a vitamin mineral premix that contains probiotics. So that that helps. And it's a, it's a multi-strain probiotic rather than a single strain. A single strain probiotic can actually imbalance the gut microbiome as much as having bad food with no probiotics can, because then you've got an overgrowth of one particular type of gut of bacteria, right? So if, let's say, for example, if you're just giving your dog acidophilus, which is a popular probiotic in the human world, mm. it's really 
it's only a hair better than no probiotic because you can still have a lot of imbalance. So a multi-strain probiotic is added to my food. Krill is added to my food. So krill oil is a really fantastic form of extra omega-3s because a lot of our meat is deficient in omega-3s. Even if you have a, an otherwise well-balanced diet, adding some extra omega-3s is a really good anti-inflammatory process, particularly if you're feeding a lot of poultry. I like to balance ruminant meat with poultry mm. because poultry tends to be higher in omega-6s okay. and lower in phosphorus. Red meat tends to be higher in omega-3s and higher in phosphorus. So you, if you are rotating through your proteins, you're getting a better balance. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's another part I didn't even talk about really is besides what you feed. And then there are some other additives that people may or may not want to consider based on the, you know, the dog's specific needs. So if you've got a, a highly active sporting dog, if you're competing in agility or fly ball or lure coursing or something like that, where your dog is really super active, you may want a higher organ meat blend. You may want a higher fat, higher calorie mm. blend. You may want to add extra omegas to that. I add fruits and vegetables to my dog's food because as I said, a dog in the wild would be having a certain amount of the pre-digested stomach contents and legally with prepared foods, we can't include the intestinal contents very easily because they're it's hard to clean them. I don't know about in the rest of the world, but in the United States, commercially prepared foods have a zero tolerance for salmonella and listeria. Of course. Yeah. And so commercially prepared foods have to pass FDA yeah. regulations for that. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that things don't slip by. We have tons of recalls. And actually that leads me to a lot of people worry about the, the bacterial problem mm -hmm. with raw food you are more likely to have bacterial contamination on cuts of meat you buy for yourself in the grocery store than you are on a commercially prepared raw dog food in mm. the United States. I can only speak to where I live because I haven't done research for the rest of the world. So when it comes to handling raw food, you should use the same cautions with handling raw dog food that you use for yourself. Dogs like humans naturally have salmonella, listeria, and E. coli present in small amounts in their GI tract. Mm -hmm. Those are normal gut microflora. They only cause a problem when they are too many, when there is an overgrowth. Eating raw food does not create an overgrowth. It actually contributes to gut balance. Okay. Therefore, helping the GI system and a dog's stomach pH is two, which is like vinegar. If you put a raw chicken bone into vinegar, tell me what it looks like in a couple of days. Yeah. It's practically disintegrated and what's left is very rubbery and soft and passes through easily. Mm. So raw bone can be safely consumed by dogs in the proper amounts. And okay. so my ideal food would have that balance of muscle, organ, bone, some added probiotics, probably added omegas in the form of a high quality fish oil, um, sardines canned in water, krill oil, and some fruits and vegetables. But I keep the fruits and vegetables to 10% or less of the total volume of the diet. Okay. Um, so, and, and I also cooked, lightly cooked or ground for the fruits and vegetables because the dog's teeth, you were going to ask that, weren't you? <laughs> the dog's teeth can't grind them appropriately. Dog's teeth are meant for ripping prey apart and crunching and gulping. They're not meant for grinding. Like yeah. if you compare a dog's molars to our molars, yeah. we're true omnivores. We can grind food. They can't. Okay. No, that's, a, no, and that was my question. So thank you for answering that. So you're welcome. Just, just a quick question. So do you, the food you mentioned that you uh, feed your dogs, is that raw or is it cooked? Yes. It's raw. It's so, raw and, and I buy it frozen. So, so what you're putting on that scale of one to 10 or zero to 10, the 10 is, is actually a, 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 a nutritionally balanced raw food diet. I feel yeah. like it would, you know, I'd love to do a full episode on raw food and to get into the detail of 
why it's, you know, why it's good for dogs, what dogs it might not be good for and how to transition to it. My mom started her dog, her dog on a raw food diet because of the pickiest eater. She'd literally just not eat for a day if she didn't like what was and the raw food is just and her coat looks amazing. But I would love to do a full episode on that. But I was going to say I could talk for two hours about. Let's so that's that's ten. My ten. Okay, that's my ten. My one Mm. is ultra processed, feed grade, grain laden chemical preservatives, artificial flavors, and colors, kibble. So that's my, actually, you know what? I'm going to make my one an unbalanced anything. Two would be ultra feed grade, ultra processed, chemically laden, but nutrient balanced. And I'm using air quotes around that. I know your listeners can't see me. Nutrient balanced, ultra processed kibble would be my two. Unbalanced anything would be my number one. Okay. So if the bulkier diet is not nutritionally balanced, I don't care if it's the freshest, most organic, most wonderful yeah. food. Okay. No, that, that's, that's really helpful. I just want to ask you a question on, I know I kind of touched on this earlier, but if, if you're going into a pet store or supermarket and you're trying to buy a bag of kibble, just to really simplify things for listeners, what are some of the basic rules that we talked about the fried, the dried and freeze dried as, as yeah. processing methods? What else? So, so I, I would look for non-GMO, human grade, organic. Those are all buzzwords I would look for. Yeah. I would look for meat, a real named meat source. So it should say beef, chicken, duck, turkey, whatever, a whole named meat source at the top of the ingredients list. Anything that appears before the listed fat is going to be a major nutrient source in that food and a mm. major ingredient in yeah. the food. So we used to say like the first five ingredients, that's not really true. It's whatever's listed before the fat source is going to be a major contributor to so, the calories and nutrients. Krista, can we do something? Can I just grab a bag yeah. of my dog's food? I won't Absolutely. Tell you what, and, and I'll just want to read the labels. Right? Absolutely. I use a combination of wet and dry, but exactly. this says it, this says it's, where is it? Deboned meat, main ingredient, and it says it's grain-free, high-quality meat, freshly prepared, then frozen, contributes to better to better digestibility and nutrition. Okay, here we go. So, composition: deboned chicken meat, twenty percent; dried chicken protein, fourteen percent; brown rice, fourteen percent; oats, thirteen point five percent; dried peas. 13%, dried turkey protein, 8%, poultry fat, 6%, protein hydro hydrolysate, 4%, beef pulp, minerals, dried carrots, and it goes into tiny percentages. And then it goes into additives, vit- so different vitamins it's listed. And then there's, it says crude protein, crude fat, crude fiber, crude ash. I don't even know what that means. Yeah. So your fiber is coming from the grains and the peas. Yeah. And the ash is basically what's left over after any heat rendering of any bone that might be in there or heat rendering of any other ingredients. So what I like about your food is that it's got a whole named meat at the top. I don't like that you've got basically rendered down proteins in there. So whenever you extract something, as opposed to putting it in its whole form, Mm. you've your, the body uses it differently. I love that it's freeze dried and not heat processed because it is true that that protects the live enzymes. So that marketing statement is correct. Okay. The body will utilize it more. If you look, however, at your meat ingredients versus your plant ingredients, add up your percentages. Yeah. How much plant ingredient do you have compared to how much meat ingredient? And I don't like that. There's something that's just called the meat protein hydrolysate. Yeah. So what hydrolyzing is, it's a way to use water to break apart molecules. Okay. And so they've basically broken up protein molecules and then smashed it back together in a new form. 
So it's kind of like that pressed chicken breast roll for sandwich meat versus real sliced chicken breast. Okay, that's that's a helpful. Does analogy. that make sense? It makes sense. I mean, to be completely honest, and I and I feel a little bit ashamed of myself saying this, I've never actually really properly looked at. So I've never actually really properly looked at the ingredients, and I feel that after this conversation, I need to do more research. However, there's one thing I do want to ask you is because. I know as, you know, as a marketer is that one of the ways that you influence how people perceive things is how yeah. you price things and how you package things. Yes. And we talked a little bit about packaging and the words that can be used, yeah. but I don't buy cheap dog food. I buy the premium stuff. Yeah. And my understanding yeah. from a lot of the reading I've been doing is that, and also, you know, just as my background as marketers, just because something's priced higher than something else, it doesn't mean it's better. Mm-hmm. So is that really the case in the world of dog food as well? It is absolutely true in the world of dog food. Your best kibble might not be your highest price kibble. Okay. So I always tell people there are a lot of things that factor into what you feed. And some of that is your lifestyle and your own health and your own beliefs about food. And so Mm. I don't tell people what to eat. I can tell you what my gold standard is and why. And I know we don't have time to delve too deeply into why I chose raw for my own pet, but it's basically because that is biologically the most appropriate food for them as a balanced yeah. raw meat-based diet with 10% or less carbohydrate and the carbohydrates coming from fruits and vegetables. So air-dried, freeze-dried kibble is far preferential. However, I would love to see fewer to no grains because with an air dried or freeze dried food, you can actually get little to no grains in there because you're not relying on grains to hold it together. Like you are with a baked or extruded kibble. You need either a high, you need a high starch content to make an extruded or a baked kibble. Otherwise it just crumbles and falls apart. I believe with an air dried or freeze dried kibble, you can get away with a much lower starch content. And so starch comes in the forms of grains and legumes. So if you're seeing peas, pea protein, rice, oatmeal. Yeah. Right. Okay. I would rather see the fiber come from a sweet potato or a squash. That's much more biologically available to a dog. Yeah. Than a pea protein is, or a grain is. And that doesn't mean that grain-free food is superior because there is that link with grain-free foods and dilated cardiomyopathy And there still is not a final word on this. There's ongoing research Mm. still years into this crisis that we've had. But the biggest links have been between low protein, lamb as the major source of protein because it's naturally lower in taurine. And Mm. so unless we add extra taurine to a lamb-based food, and if that's the only protein or the main protein you feed, you could run into trouble with that. Limited ingredient diets tend to be higher in legumes and high legume diets. Mm. So those are the four factors that come up over and over and over again in the foods that these dogs are eating that have a diet related dilated cardiomyopathy. So again, some variety in the food, lower starch foods Mm. are going to be, that's really difficult to find in a kibble. And this is why kibble ranks lower. Any kibble ranks lower my list. But an air dried kibble is far superior. And yes, it's going to be more expensive because it's much more expensive to process that. You can pump out extruded food by yeah. the millions of yeah. kilograms, you know, yeah. Yeah. In, in minutes. So and where does do that with air dried? Yeah, no, no, I, I, and, and that, that, make, that makes perfect sense. Because I would imagine it's the same with, you know, food we consume as humans. Exactly. But we've not touched on, just very briefly, if we could touch on wet food, because I've got the same yeah. brand. I yep. mix the wet and and the Excellent. and the kibble only because when I adopted my dog a few months ago, I just found that she the wet food just gave her really bad diarrhea. Yeah. So, okay. but now we're kind of transitioning. But can I just read you the ingredients off of this Absolutely. so maybe we can help listeners kind of assess? So, this one on the front says no grain. It's a pate, complete and balanced, made with natural ingredients. But yeah, let's see what this is. So it's. 66 but this is turkey so 66 percent turkey turkey broth tomato carrots minerals salmon oil and then it's got added vitamins in here i won't go into the detail of them and then crude protein 10.6 percent crude fat crude fiber crude ash moisture 80 percent so when you break that down if you take out the 80 percent moisture 
your remaining 10% protein is half of what's left. Fantastic. That okay. much more closely mimics an ancestral okay. diet balance. Okay. Right. My, and how much fat did you say? So it's the crude fat, 5.4%. Excellent. That's yeah. about a little over a quarter of what's left. Again, much more closely mimics an ancestral diet. Okay. Balance of macronutrients. That now, so how is that one processed? Is that a wet food that is in a tray or is it a wet food that's in a can? Is it, do you know if it's high heat, high pressure? It actually, it might not say. It doesn't say. These are great questions because okay. now I'm going to, I'm going to look at uh, yeah. labels very call, differently. Call or email the company and ask them how their wet food is processed. If that is not high heat, high pressure processed, yeah, I would say that sounds like a fabulous diet. Okay. I so will, you know what, I will get in touch with them for off of the dry food and onto, or I make the dry food a much smaller percentage. Yeah. So you mentioned diarrhea. You talked about that before we started recording. And I know yeah. one of the questions that you sent me ahead of time was yeah. you know, that, like changing foods. And so when the gut microbiome gets used to one thing, mm. it adapts to processing that. And when you make a sudden change, you'll see an imbalance in the gut, which can cause diarrhea. Yeah. Diarrhea is simply the, the colon, the, the large intestine isn't working efficiently to absorb the water from the food. Mm. So when the food goes through, you get a little bit of, you get a little bit of enzymes in the saliva. It goes into the stomach. It does a little more processing in the stomach, but the bulk of the processing in the dog happens in the small intestine which is where everything breaks down into like a soup and the nutrients start getting extracted mm -hmm. out of it in the small intestine. And then it goes into the large intestine where the extra water gets extracted and what comes out is what the body can't use, right? So that's the simple explanation for the GI system. Yeah. It's, it's like a subway system going from the mouth to the rectum. Yeah. If you just stay on the train and boom, you come out the other side, on the other side of the city, right? You didn't yep. get off the yeah. tube anywhere. So the, if there's diarrhea, it means that the colon isn't operating well and water's not getting extracted. And that mm -hmm. can happen for a number of reasons. But one of the big reasons when we see diarrhea, when we change foods is that it's, it's the, the gut microbiome isn't adapted to that new food. So mm -hmm. feeding a lot of probiotics, adding a little bit of raw or not heat processed food, and you can add up to 10% of your dog's calories can be any fresh food that's not toxic to dogs. And that will be helpful. Adding fiber because fiber actually is a prebiotic, which means it gives the probiotics food. So adding um, canned pumpkin or sweet potato can be a really good equalizer for the mm. GI system when you're transitioning foods. So a spoonful, depending on your dog's size, a couple of large spoonfuls for a, a larger giant yep. breed per meal, a half a teaspoon for a chihuahua per meal. It doesn't have to be exact, but adding a little bit of canned mm. pumpkin to each meal, just plain, not the pumpkin pie filling with yep. spices and squash and, and sugars, just yep. plain. And then transitioning, taking about a week to transition foods. So the first two to three days, it should be one quarter of the new food and three quarters of the old food. The next two to three days, half and half. The next two to three days, three quarters of the new and one quarter of the old. Mm. And then all to the new can be a way to help ease that transition for your yep. dog. With rescue dogs, we don't often know what they ate before they came into the rescue and the rescue is just going to feed them whatever they have. Yeah. Most rescues are operating on a shoestring budget. Yeah. They're feeding donated foods. They're feeding foods from a major label company that's, you know, endorsed by veterinarians mm. that gives them a bargain on food for sending the dogs home or the cats home with yeah. a bag of that kind yeah. of kibble. That's how it operates here in the U S or they're feeding whatever's donated, which means the dogs might be getting different food every single yeah. day. But that being said, once you choose the foods plural, that fit with your budget, your lifestyle, and your dog likes, mm. then it's a good idea to rotate through that food, mm. through those different foods yeah. regularly. I rotate proteins. I use the same brand of food, but I mm. rotate proteins every few days for my dogs. Mm. 
and I and I choose the so I have a poultry and a ruminant. I I do beef and turkey for my dogs. Chicken doesn't agree with my dogs so well. If your dog has chronic itchy skin, yeast infections in their ears, if their feet smell like um, Fritos, what we call Frito feet here in the U.S., if they smell a little okay. um, corn chippy, a little like musty, ah, those are often signs of yeast overgrowth in the system. And that happens from a Chinese medicine perspective. That happens from excess heat internally. Mm, yeah. And so chicken is a warming protein. So I cut chicken out of my diet for my dogs because both of them tend to be warm and yeasty mm. and both of them skin itching, ear infections, ear itching, paw licking all decreased greatly when I took chicken out of the mix. That's not to say chicken is bad for a lot of dogs. Chicken yeah. is the best protein for them. But so I rotate between yeah. turkey and beef. Those are readily available and affordable for me. Mm. You could do duck or pheasant or quail or goat yeah. or venison or bison or I recommend keeping one protein that you don't ever feed your dog, even as treats, mm. because if your dog ever develops a food allergy and you want to do a food elimination trial, you're going to need what's called a novel protein okay. a protein they have not been exposed to yet. Yeah. And just don't feed that protein. So my dog's actually my younger dog has never had venison so were I to need a novel protein I could try venison okay yeah neither of my dogs I think has ever had rabbit I could try rabbit as a novel protein I see. yeah right and so if I ever needed to do a food elimination trial to see how my dog reacted to a certain protein I'd want to start with one protein one carb and not do anything else yeah for three months including no flavored medication no fish oil no no licking the plate, no nothing. That's a whole, we could do a whole podcast on that too. But anyway, so feeding your rescue dog, start with what the rescue sends them home with and slowly transition to probably a better quality diet. Yeah. It's your budget, your lifestyle and your dog likes. A lot of dogs are going to turn their nose up at kibble and be picky because if I gave you the choice between a nutritionally complete cracker or biscuit every day and fresh food. And you had to eat that same biscuit day in and day out. And it was the only thing you ever got to eat. Yeah. How would you feel about that biscuit? You don't care if it's nutritionally complete. You might not even know it's nutritionally complete. Your dog doesn't know. No, I think that's a great analogy. Kristen, I cannot thank you enough. I definitely would love to have you on again because I would really yeah. like to do an episode just on raw food. And like I said, some of the, the pros and cons of, of that diet and how someone could transition their dog onto it. But this has been an incredible um, learning experience for me. And now I'm, I'm even more curious about nutrition. So thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Me. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Take care.